Hey guys, if there's one thing we can't get enough of, it's speed. Well, how do we accomplish that? We can do that either with speeding things up, in this case we're talking about processors, so we can make them go faster, or we can have more of them. That's today's topic for the Android Guy Weekly. All right, so like the other episodes, let's get some terminology and vocabulary out of the way. A CPU is a central processing unit. It's the part of a computer or a smartphone, because really those are computers these days, or even a tablet, that processes instructions. Another term for it is CPU. Another term for it these days is a core. We'll get to some differences there in just a minute. So what this does is it processes instructions from programs or from apps. The launcher being one, a screen tap might be one instruction, a, a pinch to zoom might be another instruction, go get my email might be another instruction, uh, answer this phone call. So, so those are instructions. They all get processed through. In fact, there might be dozens of instructions for each one of those tasks. But we don't want to go into too much detail here. We want to basically make everything faster, right? Everybody's about speed. They want things done instantly, super fast. Okay, great. How can we make things faster? So let's go back to what I just said. I want to uh, get that incoming call. I want to pinch to Zoom. I want to check my email, check my Facebook, check my Twitter, uh, maybe upload something to YouTube all at the same time. This is all happening in the background on my smartphone. Great. That means there's a long line of instructions waiting to be processed through the CPU. How can I make that faster? All right, time for an analogy. You ready for this? Okay, let's say you are getting on a subway. Now this subway has just one car, the train is just one car long, and it only has one door. And there's 100 seats inside of it. So far are you with me? Okay. Now what's going to happen is we need to get 100 people through that door into that subway and off to the next stop where everybody's going to get back off again. Still with me? All right. 100 instructions, or 100 people in this case. That's, that's a long line. You're going to be waiting for a while to load up that subway car. So, how can we improve that? How can we make it faster? Well, first of all, why don't we make that door wider? So that people can get into the subway car a little bit quicker. If the door's too narrow, you know, if some big guy like me is trying to get through the door, well, it's going to take a little bit longer, you know, for whatever reason to get through than some smaller person, a skinny person, a, a child, for example, it's going to take longer. So we can make the door wider. Now that would be like the bandwidth to the processor. Okay. How wide is that throughput? How, how wide is that, uh, that channel to get into the processor? We can change that. The next thing that we can do, of course, we can make the subway faster. So once everybody's loaded up, it gets from point A to point B a lot quicker. Okay, so that's, that's cool. We can do that to an extent, but eventually we run into some complications. Like, well, if we go too fast, the subway's going to jump the rails, maybe crash into the side of the tunnel. Not good. Okay, so there's, there's a theoretical maximum that we can go before we have to redesign the whole subway system to make that work. All right, so we can kind of do that. We've maxed out our speed there. What's something else we can do? Let's put in another door. So now there's a door at the front and a door at the back. Great. That door at the back, that, that's our other core, by the way. Or, hang on to that, we'll call that a hyper thread because we're still going in the same car, all right? So you've got the door in the front, the door in the back. Now uh, those hundred people, they can get in two lines. And in those two lines, they can go in, they're still going into the same car, and now we can get the processes through twice as fast, right? Ah, uh, but there's a little bit of a caveat there. What happens if you have a family who's getting on? You might not want to split up you and your wife or your kids into the two separate lines. In fact, you might have some people who have to get on after other people. Say, a mother and father want to get on before their kids to make sure that all of their kids are there. Or maybe you have the dad get in first, the kids, and then the mom get in at the, the last to make sure that all the kids got on. Okay, that makes sense. You don't want to split them up and put them at the other door. Well, computer tasks are the same way. There are some processes, some instructions that have to be run in a specific order. You can't split those up easily between two cores. So you just kind of bundle them together into a single thread in that one line. Okay, still with me? All right, 
What's something else that we can do? Well, we can add another car. In this case, that would be another core. And in this case, we're gonna put, you know, two doors in it, one in the front and one in the back. So now we have four lines. We can get a whole bunch of people in there, even if the, uh, the cars are smaller. If the cars are only 50 people each, well, we still have 100 in that train, and now we have four ways to get in. We can get in people really, really fast. And then, of course, if we keep it at the same capacity or the same clock speed, we can fit 200 people in the same space and just get a lot more people moving. Okay, so there's our analogy. It's all laid out, and, and we got kind of that all understood, right? Okay, now let's apply that to smartphones and tablets and computers. So I've got a smartphone, okay? This smartphone is a dual-core smartphone. That means it can run two processors at the same time, but it's all on the same chip. There's kind of a problem there, okay? Once we put those two subway cars on the track, it takes twice as much energy to pull those cars down the track, right? Same thing with a dual core phone or, or having two processors in a phone. Essentially, you're doubling, again, theoretically, you're doubling your, your processing power, but you're also doubling your energy requirements. If they were completely discrete CPUs, completely separate chips, that would most likely be true. There would be some advantages to that, Okay, increased speed being one, because you know you got two processors to push instructions through. You don't have to wait as long, so the screen might be able to be off for a longer amount of time, which will save you some power and some other things like that. But you're able to get the processes in and done and through, and it's great. But that battery back there, it's only so big. Once your battery's gone, you're gone, and having an extra processor in there might be a problem. Well, dual core chips kind of negate that. Not entirely, but to a certain extent. You're essentially adding more transistors to one chip, which is going to take more power, but it's not going to take as much power as if you had two separate chips. So there's the question, and really the topic for this edition of the Android Guy Weekly. How many cores do we need? Well, for a long time I had a single core processor. You probably did too, unless you just jumped into the Android world today. Most of the phones out there, up until about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, were single core. And they work just fine because, well, it's a phone. It's not all that complicated. There's not a lot of processing that we do on it. We don't do a lot of heavy lifting with them. Now, compared to computers of yesteryear, yeah, we do. But in general, the operating systems are lightweight, they're intelligent, these are risk processors, so we have reduced instruction sets. We just really grease the wheels to get things in and through the processor and on their way so that the phones feel fast. And for the most part, they do. And that's great. When you get multiple cores inside of a phone, you're just greasing the wheels even more as long as your operating system supports it. Android Ice Cream Sandwich does. Honeycomb Kinda does. Gingerbread, not so much. Froyo, it was, yeah, we're not even gonna talk about Froyo. All right, but dual core, it works great. I love it. It doesn't really impact the battery that much. I get about the same life out of this phone as I did on my G2, which is really, really kind of cool. You know, this being so much faster and a bigger screen and yeah, so cool. The battery's a little bit bigger too, but we're not gonna talk about batteries today. So let's get back to cores. So that's my smartphone. Next up, I have 7.7 inch tablet. Now this tablet, I do the same things that I do on my phone. Now on my phone, I don't play a lot of games. Well, not really in depth, intense games. I could, but I don't. I don't do a lot of heavy lifting. I don't do video editing. I don't do audio editing. I don't do really processor intensive stuff. It's just normal stuff and it runs through just as fast as I need it to. It's great. Well, I do the same things over here. The only difference that I have is, well, the screen's bigger, so I need a bigger battery, and I don't use this for phone calls. Now, I do some video chat and whatnot on, on Google Chat, but that's kind of not the point, because I use my phone for voice calls more. Essentially, that's a big smartphone, okay? Until we talk about 10-inch tablets. Okay, so here's a Motorola Zoom. It's 10-inch. Very, very similar in size, battery life, and whatnot to the Apple iPad. Now, this is where things get interesting. Right now, in both the Apple camp and the Android camp, and 
we don't know so much about the Windows camp until Windows 8 comes out, but we'll, uh, we'll reserve judgment on that for later. These are essentially just big smartphones without the phone. Okay, and that's it's one of the things that I joked about when the iPad first came out. It's just like the iPhone, but bigger and without the phone. And it was. Of course, that's oversimplifying and it's being more humorous than anything, but that's essentially true. The apps are essentially the same. Of course, they're designed a little bit differently to take advantage of the bigger screen, but there's not a lot that you can do on a tablet that you can't do on a smartphone, whether it's Apple or Android. Now, we're starting to see that change. Okay, and let me kind of, uh, well, skip past that a little bit. Video editing, for example, you can't do much of it, a little bit, sure, but you can't do a lot on an iPad or even on an Android-powered tablet. But, again, 10.1 inch, right? I've got a laptop behind me that's 11 inches. It's a netbook. It's got a dual core processor in it. This has a dual core, dual core, dual core, all right? So we've got all these dual core machines. My laptop, I do video editing on. Okay, it's got a bunch of RAM. It's got a relatively large hard drive, 128 gig SSD, which isn't huge, but compared to what I have in my tablet, you know, it's about four times the amount but I can do video editing on it. It's big enough, it's got a keyboard, I've got a mouse that goes with it, I can do video editing. It takes a long time to do video editing. Hence why I have a desktop computer that's a quad core with hyper-threading, so it looks like eight again. I can do so much more stuff, or, or the same amount of stuff, so much faster, depending on how you look at it, because of the many cores. So. How much is enough, and how much is too much, and how much is not enough? Here's my thoughts, okay? But this is your part of the show. Use the comments down below. You can use my, uh, my comments that I'm going to tell you right now and either rebut those or agree with those or disagree with those. Share your thoughts with everybody else who's watching, okay? Single core, dual core. A single core on a smartphone, a very basic entry level one, I think is fine. I don't think that's a problem, and we've seen that in the past. On a higher-end phone, especially with bigger screens and high-definition screens like we talked about in the last episode, dual-core, absolutely no doubt. Okay? Then we get into our small tablets. Small tablets, dual-core, absolutely must. Single-core, uh-uh, pass them up if it doesn't have a single-core, or if it has a single-core. If it doesn't have at least dual-core, pass that puppy up. Big tablets. Okay, 10 inch, maybe even above when we get those, that's where your tablet stops being a tablet or a big smartphone and it starts being a small computer. You team it up with a, a keyboard, you team it up with you know, whatever else to make it more productive, however you need to do that. At that point, it's less a smartphone and more a computer. And that's where dual core, absolutely. Quad core, probably. Okay, and I might even say definitely once we get some apps that take advantage of multiple cores or that require multiple cores. Okay, you're going to get to a point where you can't run some of these apps on a smartphone or even a small tablet because they just don't have enough processing power in them. That's where bigger batteries come into play with the larger tablets and where those multiple cores, you know, four, eight, who knows how many, are really going to come into play. At that point, you can truly replace your laptop computer, maybe someday your desktop computer, with a tablet as long as it's got the right peripherals to do what you need them to do. So those are my thoughts. Now it's your turn. Like I said, agree with them, disagree with them, post your own, justify them, and help everybody else who's watching this understand how you use your smartphone and your small tablet and your big tablet, or if you don't have all three, which one do you have? What do you use? How many cores do you think is enough? How many do you think is ideal? How many do you think is too much? Let us know down in the comments. And of course, if you've got somebody who disagrees with you, bring them on over to pocketnow.com and to the video so that they can comment and voice their opinion as well. If you like contributing like this, of course, give the video a big thumbs up. That will help share your views and that you like this video with your friends. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. We'll have a link at the end so you can. And 
of course, comment. I can't stress that enough. We, we love your comments and love your feedback. So that has been this week's episode of the Android Guy Weekly. We look forward to seeing you next time. If you have suggestions or recommendations for a topic, make sure you let us know. You can contact me through pocketnow.com. For Pocket Now, I'm Joe Levi.